<laughs> Perfect Dutch. Yeah, yeah. I lived there. <laughs> so good good morning. Um, I think we are now live. Um, it's my, my pleasure to, to welcome everybody to this uh, virtual webinar. Um, we have uh, an hour and a half of, uh, of exchanges. We will have a presentation that will be made by George Cunningham on the Indo-Pacific strategy and the council conclusions announced on Monday. This is fresh off the press. Secondly, we'll have um, uh, Director Thibaut Kleiner presenting the digital compass. That will be half an hour's uh, presentation in total. And then we have the hour of power with uh, Micah and Karthik, Micah in the Netherlands and Karthik in Singapore presenting the study itself. And then we have the Q&A and then we have Ambassador at Large and Special Envoy for Connectivity, Roman of Lahutin making closing remarks. Um, before we start, um, I just like to do a family photo with the uh, participants and also welcome Brigitte, who is one of the three who wrote the study. Um, I was looking at digital connectivity and the word digital or digit comes from fingers. Uh, connectivity, if we look at sign language, uh, this is the sign, um, which is you put your two hands together, you make the OM sign, and then you interlink. And what I like to do is to make a family photo with the uh, participants on the screen now, making connect in, in sign language. So here we go, three, two, one, hand, OM, and then linking together. And that, so I think Inga has now taken the family photo. Great, thank you. I was going to do this, but I didn't do that. <laughs> so we, we, I, it's my pleasure now to, to introduce uh, this panel. Uh, and I, I would just like to start with a quote from Nikola Tesla, who I understand was born in Croatia, but then ended up in the United States. Um, he said in the last century, when wireless is perfectly applied, the whole earth will be converted into a brain. And I think now we will be hearing from the, from the brains of the, the study and the brains from the European External Action Service and DG Connect, the CPU of the EU, uh, and also in Singapore on their thoughts on digital connectivity. Um, I'd like to now introduce George Cunningham, the strategic advisor on the in Asia Pacific, which may have to be renamed the Indo-Pacific after the strategy. He's also the ASEM alternate SOM, working with 53 countries. He was deputy in Afghanistan, a deputy working on China, our head person in charge in New Zealand. He has 25, he's celebrating his 25th Silver Jubilee at the European Union. And a little known fact, um, he walked 9,000 kilometers under presidential orders from Cairo to Cape Town. And I think now he's going to take us on a journey from the shores of East Africa through Afghanistan down to the Austral Islands, or maybe as the Dutch have said, Indo-Pacific is from Pakistan to Palau. So over to you, George, uh, please explain to us why we have this Indo-Pacific strategy, number one. Number two, what are the main takeaways? Um, and number three, what's next? So over to you. Sorry, you're on mute. Yes, uh, thank you, Asad, and uh, for the great introduction and digging out all that dirt from the past. Um, may have been walking Africa in my wicked youth, but um, now I'm swimming uh, <laughs> the Indo-Pacific uh, at the end of my career, actually. So I'm um, happy to be with you. Uh, I'm just going to really be giving a very short introduction because the main uh, issue is digitalization, but I'm just putting the whole thing in context, really, uh, because we, on 19th of April, that is on this Monday, we had uh, council conclusions, Foreign Affairs Council, um, on um, uh, the EU strategy uh, for the Indo-Pacific, uh, working with our, with our partners, cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. 
And uh, first answering the question of Dear Assad, um, why is it uh, now? Well, um, there's two reasons, I guess. One is uh, a lot of pressure from our member states uh, for us to have a European uh, Union strategy for the Indo-Pacific, which is a very much a maritime kind of thing. Um, and that is because um, there's been a buildup of um, countries um, and entities that are having Indo-Pacific uh, strategies. Uh, Japan started in 2007, a long time ago, but then uh, picking up speed Australia 2013, India 2014, United States came in 2017, ASEAN, the block of 10 uh, countries in 2019, New Zealand 2019, and just most recently uh, this year, the UK. And then, of course, not forgetting the fact that uh, three of our member states ha have strategies or strategic outlooks as well. France that uh, came on board in 2018, Germany uh, and the Netherlands last year. And it was those three last countries, member states, uh, along with uh, seven other member states that called upon the European Union to have a strategy uh, on the Indo-Pacific uh, in December and hey presto in April, uh, in the speed of lightning when it comes to the European Union, uh, we have the strategy in place, which has actually been agreed by the 27 uh, foreign ministers uh, of, the, of the European Union. And this is uh, because um, we want to sort of refocus um, and give a further a new political impetus uh, for our activities in the Inter-Pacific region. Um, we, it is a very important region in terms of uh, the socioeconomic recovery, which we are trying to uh, try to uh, encourage our uh, Asian partners to be green uh, and digital. And that is why this particular seminar is, uh, is very, very important in that respect, in terms of exploring the possibilities with you know, what we can be doing with our partners in the region and certainly will feed into the joint communication, which uh, unusually soup, uh, is, is, um, is next uh, planned in September, normally joint communication by the high representative and the commission first, uh, then comes the council conclusions. This time it's been done the other way around. Uh, for the sake of speed and, and giving the sort of the member state imprints on, on the whole process. So um, because of um, the importance of the region in terms of economic our socioeconomic recovery, and that so we're so intertwined in terms of trade and investment, um, because it is uh, has uh, tremendous advances in technology, uh, and also because um, by 2013, something like 90% uh, of the growth of the middle class is meant to come from the region. In other words, in terms of the Europe's prosperity, it's a, it's a very important place to be. So that is why uh, we moved ahead with uh, having a strategy, uh, which is, as I said, sort of a refocus and a recommitment uh, to the region, uh, and it's also to kind of align ourselves with the other partners that have uh, Indo-Pacific approaches. Now, the second thing is, what are the main takeaways? Well, um, the uh, strategy um, is um, for, for council conclusions, remarkably long, 2,700 words. Normally council conclusions might be under 1,000 words, maybe 500 words, because of course it's rubber stamping uh, with some adjustments, uh, a joint communication. Uh, but it's a particular case because it's leading the way. It is a particularly lengthy document and quite detailed. Um, and I wanted to say that uh, really the, um, you might divide the document into two parts. The first part is uh, recommitment to our principles and, and values, <clears throat> what we stand for in the region, uh, particularly uh, free and open uh, supply lines, for instance, UNCLOS and so on. Those are sort of things that you know well the European Union stands for in terms of principles and values. Um, and then a specific set of programs uh, which we are um, engendering um, to um, try to uh, refocus and broaden the activity. Um, so we're looking at partnerships and dialogues, how we're supposed to interact with our partners, particularly, as I said, because we are kind of joining the club of the Indo-Pacific partners. Um, we're looking at health systems um, because of COVID-19, of course, so this is completely uh, new um, and will be um, further uh, elaborated in the joint communication. Of course, human rights, disaster risk reduction, the Green Deal and Blue Oceans, how we can impart that onto um, the, uh, the Indo-Pacific in terms of some of the concepts the European Union has in terms of um, the recovery. Uh, we want to strengthen regional organizations there, um, technological cooperation, sustainable and prosperity, advancing, of course, the great connectivity agenda and intensify cooperation with our partners in multilateral uh, fora. Um, and also we have a, an important security and defense uh, aspect for the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and you will see, I think, um, um, 
perhaps it's not the time to go into it in detail, but I think you should look at the council conclusions because we are hoping to have, um, a, we have inserted into the council conclusions, the wording um, that we should have a meaningful European naval presence in the Indo-Pacific, and that's acknowledged as important for the future. Um, and that's something that will be uh, further, of course, elaborated in the joint communication. Now, the terminology Indo-Pacific um, sounds uh, sometimes or is sometimes interpreted as anti-China. Uh, this is not the case uh, with us. It's an inclusive strategy. China has a place as a partner, after all, it is a strategic partner of the European Union, like any other country. Um, but of course, we are working in terms of uh, principles, values, or uh, common interests. In the case of China, we don't have uh, the values necessarily, well, not at all aligned, really. But we have common interests, such as climate change, in which China is a vital component of um, solving the, the issue. So in the case of that, and in case of other areas like GCPOA, that is the Iranian nuclear deal, and other important areas where we can cooperate with China, and China is willing to cooperate with us, we are happy to, to make the deal and progress together. So um, in short, um, please read the council conclusions, quite an interesting document, it's gone down very well. Um, it's been commented on favorably by the Japanese, uh, and in fact, all our uh, Indo-Pacific partners have, com com um, have welcomed it, uh, and now beginnings, the, the beginnings of public welcoming as well, and Japan was the first one to do the public welcoming uh, by the foreign minister and the head of cabinet of the, of the prime minister on the issuing of this uh, particular document. Um, I think it has a lot of potential. It has um, pushed back into the high, uh, highlighted and pushed back into the center stage the, uh, the, the whole region. That's important because um, until now, the focus has been a lot to do with the neighborhood, a lot to do with Africa. Um, and uh, yet this is a region which is uh, the future of the world. And it is the future of our prosperity in terms of trade and investment. So that is very important as well internally and the recognition of member states and everybody that the focus has to now be as well on the Indo-Pacific. So thank you very much for that. Uh, if I hopefully have answered your three questions uh, and I shall do this sign, which means I have answered your three questions. <laughs> and I turn over to our great friends uh, to continue this, um, this presentation. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, George. And I think, um... I appreciate very much this is um, immediately after the after that you have captained the council conclusions um, through sometimes some stormy waters through the EU system. But I think this is only the beginning. This is not, not the end. So I think in September you will announce the joint communication on, on this uh, strategy. And I think what will be interesting, maybe that will come in the Q&A is how connectivity especially digital connectivity fits into this. Also in the chat, we, you, um, the council conclusions and also uh, an, in, an interesting fact sheet has been shared. I, I also saw that um, Indo-Pacific, um, in, Indo actually comes from the word in, Indus River. Um, and uh, at the time, I think the explorers from Persia and Arabia couldn't pronounce the S. So instead of calling it the Sindh, it, in the, the name of the river is the river Sindh. And inst instead of Sindhu River, it was called the Indus River um, by, by others. Otherwise, this would be called the Sindo Pacific strategy. And of course, Pacific means peace. So thank you, George. Uh, we now turn to digital connectivity. Uh, we have uh, Director Thibaut Kleiner from DG Connect. He's director for, you're director for policy, strategy, and outreach at DG Connect. And I think the name of your DG is, uh, says, says it all. Um, you, you're, you're now 20 years in the European Commission, 10 years working on competition policy, including in the cabinet for competition, Commissioner uh, Vice President Nelly Cross, your advisor to her as well, in charge of the digital agenda, Deputy Head of Cabinet for Commissioner Oettinger. So you have a lot of cabinet experience, but also experience within the DG Connect world. Responsible also for captain, being the captain, uh, making sure the digital compass was, was agreed 
and will now be implemented. My questions to you would be sort of in terms of general context, the, we, we see the danger of a one world, two systems. Some people are saying that the United States favors, favors a business approach to digital connectivity. China proposes a state-centered approach to digital, whereas the EU has a third way, which is human-centered. What I'd like to ask you in your presentation is uh, why does the EU have a digital comp compass? Number two, a compass has north, east, west, and south. What are the cardinal points? Um, what, what are the main uh, directions that you're giving uh, the European Union? And thirdly, how will you implement this? And if you could say a few words about the Digital Connectivity Fund and also partnership with countries around the world. So over to you. And I think we have a, power, we have a presentation that our, our colleague Inga is going to present, please. Very good. And many thanks for this, uh, this very kind uh, introduction. So indeed, uh, uh, Thibaut Kleiner, Director for Policy Strategy and Outreach in DigiConnect. Uh, and really, uh, uh, it's my pleasure and privilege to be here with you today, because I think that, uh, uh, as my, my colleague was just mentioning, we, we have a, a very vibrant uh, agenda towards this region. And in terms of uh, digital connectivity, and maybe we can start with the, the next slide, uh, I think that uh, what is important for uh, our international uh, outreach uh, is that uh, we see today how the digital technologies have become so important for everyone. I think that it was already the case to a large extent before the COVID crisis, but I think through this crisis and during the pandemic, digital technologies uh, have been the essential element to continue basically uh, working, to continue having social activity, to continue learning. So they have taken an even bigger uh, place in our life. And the problem is that through this, we also found that uh, there are also some problems as well, that you know, some people are excluded from this digital transformation. And also we saw very concretely that the EU was also exposed to some dependencies in terms of technology and so on. So the digital compass to answer your question, I would say has two uh, objectives. Uh, the first one, and it was very much also what uh, Commissioner, sorry, our President, uh, you know, uh, uh, Van der Leyen uh, uh, explained in a State of the Union speech uh, last year. The first objective was really to put digital at the same level as green uh, in terms of understanding uh, for the people. Uh, as you were saying, uh, you know, we believe that uh, the EU is somehow a third way. Uh, and that somehow we have not really engaged with our citizens sufficiently to ask them, what do you want from this digital transformation? Uh, it's not enough to consuming these technologies. We need also to shape them in a way that corresponds to our values, to our preferences, and also to, to our uh, interest in terms of uh, what we want to deliver from these technologies. Uh, this you can see very strongly also, for instance, from the proposal we made yesterday on uh, artificial intelligence, where we both try to support the adoption of this technology. And at the same time, we try to mitigate possible risks through uh, regulation. And that's the same, uh, uh, broadly speaking, uh, for our current agenda. We want to make sure that we have this shared vision on the digital transformation and that we deliver something where we can empower people and businesses to really seize this human, sustainable, and prosperous digital future, if you want. And this is where this uh, uh, compass uh, plays a role, because the idea is that we are still now trying to get out of uh, the, the economic crisis. We have a big investment plan in Europe, uh, uh, you know, this uh, next generation EU, 20% of it will go to digital, so it's a boost really to this transformation, but we think it's essential that we have a longer term objective. So towards 2030, we want to really have these ambitions and also to have a common EU 
objective. So that, you know, we have this also idea that it, it has to be uh, not just some member states moving forward, it has to be the whole of the EU, all our regions, all our people need to be part of this positive narrative and this ambitious uh, story for our digital transformation in the European continent. So the four cardinal points, you know, you see here we have put basically uh, uh, KPIs, key performance indicators and targets, what we want to reach by, um, you know, the, the next uh, digital decade, so 2030. The first one has to do with skills. We believe that, sorry, if you stay in the previous slide, uh, skills uh, is really essential because that's basically, uh, you know, the starting point for everything we are doing. And we want to have 80% of the population at least having basic digital skills. And we also want to have specialists, uh, you know, 20 million is quite an ambitious target knowing that we are at uh, about nine today. And we want to see also more uh, female uh, working in this area. So the first element skills. Second one, very important, infrastructures. We want to make sure that the EU you know, is really at the forefront of some of these technologies, uh, be it from connectivity, so 5G is an obvious case, but also we want to make sure that we have in Europe capabilities as regards semiconductors, extremely important worldwide. We are currently depending actually, uh, you know, largely from, from Asia, and we need to make sure that we not only design these microchips, but also produce them. We want to make sure also that we embrace the data revolution. And one angle there is that uh, we think uh, we, we, there's the next generation of cloud computing, and we want to make sure that Europe is leading that, as well as leading on quantum computing. So the second cardinal point, infrastructures. And you see skills and infrastructure is very much the supply side of the digital transformation. But we also want to make sure that this transformation is fully embraced across the board. And that means businesses should move very quickly towards ambitious area. And we think that really, in terms of the take up of these technologies, we can be at horizon 2030, really uh, uh, there as well with more or less all EU companies, including SMEs, using cloud, using artificial intelligence, using big data. And we also want to make sure that we have uh, uh, grow, that we can grow the scale-ups, you know, the leading disruptors in the EU, you know, these EU unicorns, as we call them. And at the same time, we also want, and this is the fourth cardinal point, that governments transform themselves, that really they embrace the digital transformation and provide also their public services online. So you see, this is with government and, and business is the demand side uh, uh, from the digital transformation. And with this, we believe that we have really uh, through this compass, uh, a way forward that is stigmatizing some, some elements that will together, we believe, bring the level of uh, the EU as a whole uh, towards really a, a better future that is inclusive, but that is also prosperous and sustainable. And maybe then we can uh, say something about how we can deliver this. Uh, next slide. Uh, the idea is that we should also have uh, some elements around digital citizenship. That's very much the EU way. We want to have clearly spelled out all these principles, all these fundamental rights uh, applied to, to the digital sector and be able to really write it down so that we have for everyone in the EU, but also for our partners, a clear indication as to what our European way is, you know, what it means uh, to develop these technologies and how we can also tell our citizens what they can expect from these technologies. So that's something we are, we are starting. We will very soon have a, a, a broad uh, a public consultation. And we're also interested actually of, of the views of our partners internationally in terms of where we stand for these uh, elements. And you see here just examples that we were listing. Some of them are certainly uh, you know, familiar to you, the idea that we should have access to uh, you know, uh, networks, access to digital health uh, services. Other uh, principles have to do with security and uh, uh, trust online. Others have to do with the protection of children, for instance, and uh, ethical principles for human-centric algorithm. This is essentially what we announced uh, yesterday for our artificial intelligence uh, 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 regulation. So all these elements are more or less existing in pieces of legislation here, there, 
we want to codify this and make sure that we have a basis for the next decade that will inform our policy and also make sure that our regulation, our legislation fits with this European way uh, towards the digital transformation. And in the next slide, just I will try to take you quickly through some elements we have uh, announced to deliver these outcomes. First, internally in the EU, we want to make sure that we have a new approach to this uh, governance where we have every year a reporting on progress on these goals and principles, and also that we can discuss with our member states to maybe improve situation, correct it, and make sure that we together uh, work towards improving our situation and reaching these objectives uh, by the end of the decade. Uh, next slide. Uh, one of the elements here as well is the international angle. And I think one of the most important messages of uh, our compass is that actually we should not distinguish uh, the inside and the outside as far as the digital transformation is concerned. For the EU, the same values apply you know, inside and in our uh, interactions uh, with partners. The same values we want to promote uh, globally. We want also to make sure that we are uh, clearly expressing our commitment to multilateralism and that we have also an open rule-based uh, trade system so that it reflects as well uh, what we uh, organize inside of the EU. So this uh, uh, vision really is one where uh, this international uh, partnership is reflecting our strength internally, just like we have our regulation internally, we think we can offer it uh, for uh, our partners so that we have this toolbox that will follow these four cardinal points, if you want, and work with partners around three big uh, pillars, you know, the regulatory cooperation, research and innovation, and then investments, notably in connectivity. And this is very important, and that's also for today very relevant. Uh, we believe that when we partner uh, with uh, uh, international uh, uh, friends uh, and uh, even competitors, we can build this common agenda because we have a clear uh, vision of the, the parameters, the areas where we can collaborate. And we have also a clear mapping as to what can be done through this Team Europe approach, which builds together, we brings together the EU, the member states and our own industry, if you want. So we can really develop this uh, full uh, engagement. And we want actually also there to build on a renewed transatlantic uh, relationship so that we bring forward uh, you know, this uh, EU European way, if you want, uh, also to the global stage. So in a nutshell, uh, this uh, digital compass is also our international strategy for the future. It's about really defining our priorities. It's about organizing really this partnership in a structured manner and having more, I would say, of a common approach uh, that involves also, uh, you know, our member states uh, and industry. And maybe uh, uh, the last slide, I would uh, want to flag a little bit also as you were asking, uh, specifically, we have announced for uh, connectivity that we will uh, pay particular attention to also the, the, the regions that are uh, close to us in terms of, uh, you know, uh, neighborhood, uh, Africa, but also, uh, as was also explained, we have already developed for connectivity a very clear agenda towards, uh, you know, Asia and towards the Indo-Pacific uh, 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 region somehow. So there is already things uh, there being prepared. We were just discussing earlier, uh, a few days ago, actually, with uh, our Indian uh, partners uh, preparing the summit. And I can tell you that uh, there was a lot of interest. It was a very rich discussion. And we have also had there, you know, very a positive development in terms of reinforcing this uh, connectivity agenda. And in that respect, the communication has proposed the creation of a digital connectivity fund. That's something we believe can be very useful to have an additional instrument to cover maybe gaps in our programs. You know, we have some funding, we have some collaboration, but we think that this fund will really cover the possibility of linking continents and specific uh, regions also between themselves, so that we have really there as well uh, a dedicated instrument for connectivity. So we are actually now working uh, with colleagues uh, to explore the, the feasibility of this fund and look 
you know, how much resource we can bring uh, already next year into this uh, initiative uh, so that very, very soon we can, you know, launch the first uh, investment. So I would stop there saying that really the digital compass was welcomed by the European Council a few uh, weeks ago. Uh, so we have really now a very clear agenda in front of us. We'll come back with some legislative proposal in the autumn, but we believe that with this compass, uh, we really have the possibility to connect even better with our partners in a way that is going to be a win-win formula. Um, th thank you so much, um, Director Thibault Kleiner, for your very clear and uh, substantive presentation. Some of the takeaways I, I see that we have to address this digital gap um, in terms of skills, infrastructure, business and government. Something I was intrigued by is also e-health under government and maybe e-commerce. So th these will be areas that we can develop. Also developing our e-skills and also investing in, in 5G and maybe 6G and what comes beyond. Um, I, I also see the importance that you paid to the transatlantic agenda. Um, I know that the Bella Cable has been announced under the Portuguese presidency linking Europe with with Latin America and maybe even making a detour to Africa. And we, we will now be putting more emphasis also on the Indo-Pacific, as you mentioned, engagement with India, where we are looking to, to sign a connectivity partnership with India on the 8th of May. And I think issues of uh, an open, safe and an inclusive digital uh, world is, is of interest to us and, and our partners around the world, including in the Indo-Pacific. So thank, thank you very much um, and for, for taking your valuable time to, to present and to uh, address the audience, which I think is uh, about eight, 80 people on the call. So many thanks thank you. to you. Yeah, thank you. I, I now would like to invite the authors of the, uh, the report, um, namely Micah and Karthik. So this is the hour of power or the hour of intellectual power. We will hear from you um, brief introductions on the reports. Um, and then after that, I'd like to invite the, the participants to put their questions in the chat. I will then call out their name and then Inka will ask them to put the question orally to the panelists. I, I start, um, sorry, <clears throat> with Dr. Micah Okan, Okano Hymans. She's a senior research fellow at Klingendal. She also teaches at the University of Leiden and is also uh, the key interlocutor for all matters connectivity with the Dutch um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Dutch government. So I think um, she has a, she was, her main area of research is also looking at connectivity. I remember she, she was on the, uh, on the first Europa Connectivity Forum that took place in September 2019. She's also the scientific coordinator of APRAN, the uh, ad advi providing advice and research on the Asia Pacific uh, region. And she has studied not only in the Netherlands, but in Japan and Australia. So I think you, you bring the Indo-Pacific Indo perspective personally as well. I'd like to ask you, Micah, if you can explain from the study, how can we have an open, safe and inclusive digital connectivity? Why are we having this now? And how can we engage with partners? So please, over to you for a presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Assad, um, for, uh, for having me, of course, and for uh, well, granting an opportunity to study this, uh, what I think is a very important uh, topic. Um, and indeed, I think perhaps we should start also, uh, or I should start by explaining why Karthik and I in this study uh, focus on connectivity, because that's not the first thing that most people will think of um, when they think of the Indo-Pacific. Um, because of course this, this, um, uh, this concept has its roots in, in the maritime domain. 
as we all know, and I think most countries in the region, uh, in the Pacific region, have been looking out for what is going to be uh, happening in the in the maritime and security fields. Uh, what what can we expect from Europe uh, towards the future? Um, so I think it's important that George, as he mentioned, um, well, was talking about um, increasingly meaningful European presence uh, of European countries uh, in those increasingly contested waters. Um, so that's that's one thing. Um, the reason why we focused on digital is that we think we should look beyond just this domain, uh, because, of course, this is where some countries, uh, European member states, can deliver, uh, especially France, um, but also the UK as a European powerhouse. Um, the Netherlands and Germany now also considering, but I think there's more to offer. Um, and there's this other domain, the high tech and digital domain, that's uh, also very contested um, in the Indo-Pacific regions. Um, and uh, I think this is also where the EU can really bring added value, respond to requests from countries in the region to help them to not be, uh, well, forced into a sort of, uh, um, well, a choice for either the United States or China or, you know, a, a binary choice. So the Europe can here bring in, I think, um, opportunities for those countries to, to develop. Um, and to well to con to consider how they want to position themselves as the standards for in the digital domain are being developed. So I think that's uh, that's the, the sort of the, the bigger background to why we got to this uh, element of the Indo-Pacific. So I was very happy uh, indeed to find that uh, the digital domain, of course, um, was also mentioned in this uh, well announced uh, strategy um, last Monday in the Council conclusions. Um, so there's three main reasons, I think, uh, why uh, the, the EU and the member states will act in the field of digital connectivity. Um, we uh, briefly uh, discussed them in the report. Um, and the first is, of course, as I said, this is an increasingly contested uh, domain. And uh, the, now is really the time that the norms and the standards uh, for the use of technologies that are being developed um, are being set. Um, and the EU and, uh, and many countries in the Indo-Pacific, I think, uh, share concerns um, about um, how they, uh, technologies are used um, in a ways that, uh, that might suppress or offer more freedom uh, for citizens um, who are using them. Um, and also about, uh, well, the, the, the regulatory power that, um, that big tech companies might have. Um, also, secondly, um, it's about reaping opportunities. I mean, this is a this is a region uh, where uh, there's a vibrant digital uh, ecosystem. Um, there's e-commerce that's thriving. Um, fintech is is booming, and there's many opportunities that I think uh, European uh, companies should also act on. Um, and only by being present, uh, by having uh, firms, our firms present in the region, can we, I think, help also stimulate the economy and, and try and tweak it, uh, stir it in a, a more sustainable uh, di direction, uh, green, as George mentioned. Um, so this is, uh, I think, also it's an important economic opportunity and an, and an opportunity to, uh, to engage uh, with those countries. Um, and then third, um, which is building on that second point, I think indeed European actors have plenty to offer. Uh, we just heard uh, Mr. Thibault Kleiner speak about regulation. And we know, of course, that uh, countries in the region, um, ASEAN countries, but also India, have been looking at Europe, uh, have been wanting to learn from data regulation, for example, that uh, the EU was first uh, to, to introduce. Um, now we're moving uh, to AI regulation. Um, and I think um, that's, uh, well, don't expect them, of course, to copy what we are doing here in Europe. Uh, perhaps they can uh, even do slightly better where we have perhaps uh, been too restrictive on, on uh, innovation, for example, by too strict regulation. They can find a middle way and we are sort of repairing, I think, that also. So it will be a, a two way street, I think, also benefiting, uh, also benefiting Europe. Um, what is important, as I discuss this with uh, people here in Europe, oftentimes I get the question, well, you know, are those countries uh, in the region uh, really wanting to engage with Europe? Do they want to see a presence of Europe there? Uh, and that's a hard yes. I think that is very important a point also to make uh, for everybody who has not yet seen uh, the, um, the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies uh, uh, poll that came out again for the third time this year uh, in January. 
the state of Southeast Asia, um, it is very clear that the elites, at least in, in the countries, um, in uh, more specifically the ASEAN, but I think it goes for Indo-Pacific more broadly, um, they really they, they look at Europe as, as, a, as a country, as a champion um, in specific fields, uh, global governance, uh, free trade, um, and, the, and the EU is after Japan the second most trusted uh, and strategic partner uh, in the eyes of, uh, of those people. So this is also sort of almost a responsibility um, that, uh, that, or, uh, that gives, the, I think, the EU legitimacy to act. Um, and uh, so that's, the, I think, the, the bigger context. Um, now, Karthik, of course, will uh, will discuss in a few minutes uh, the, the 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 various uh, subdomains that we looked at, uh, which are uh, digital economy, specifically e-commerce, data governance, uh, fintech, um, also the export of digital infrastructures, or what you could call digital uh, development assistance, and big tech regulation. So we did delve into more detail with uh, specific sectors. Um, and we focused on, uh, on basically uh, three countries um, that we believe can also be uh, sort of the springboard for the EU um, as uh, it engages with countries in the region. Um, and so it's ASEAN as a, as a regional institution, because of course that's uh, where the EU uh, is also a natural partner of. And then the three countries are India, Indonesia, uh, and Singapore. Um, and as I said, those can really anchor the EU's digital engagement with the region, uh, because they are the, the ones that are already very developed. Uh, they know, of course, uh, well, they, the, the, the context that they are working in and the, the context of, of other countries that are at earlier stages of development of the digital economy. Um, so I think it's important to engage with them. Um, and, um, well, there's um, also perhaps, uh, well, to acknowledge that quite a lot is already happening. Cybersecurity, for example, I think EU ASEAN declaration several years ago was already signed. Uh, specifically, the Netherlands is working with Indonesia, acting on that EU ASEAN broad framework. Um, there's also, uh, well, the Digital Economy and Society Index that uh, Mr. Kleiner just mentioned is already also being taken to the region um, in the ASEAN Digital Index. So it's, uh, I think there's, there's uh, several things already uh, happening, uh, but considering the importance of this topic, uh, it's important to do more. And there's many opportunities to do that. Um, in closing, let me just highlight some of the challenges, um, because this is, of course, a broad topic linking three policy areas, connectivity, Indo-Pacific and digital. Um, and the digital compass is the international, uh, of course, sort of, uh, well, the, the attempt to take the Europe's digital two instruments and digital policies towards the region. Um, but I think that's a relatively new uh, development. We've been focused more on EU internal. Um, naturally, because first we have to know what we stand for, what are the values that we want to protect. Um, but it's uh, it's really important that we take this out. And that involves then linkages uh, between um, the, well, the different, what we call, of course, in, in Brussels, director generals, the ministries in other countries. Um, and that that is a challenge. So I'm, I, I hope that this uh, discussion, this report will also provide more impetus for people from uh, DG Connect, from DG Trade, from External Action Service, from uh, the, the, the Director General working on, on the European neighborhood, because there's lessons also we can take from there to the Indo-Pacific, I think, um, and uh, development uh, in PAP, that they can work together to make this happen. Um, and I think I, I already used too much time. I should really leave it to Karthik now to, um, to develop some of those points. And th thank you, Micah, for uh, introducing the topic and painting a, a broad but detailed picture. I can see that in your analysis, you look at the opportunities, including not only values under norms, but interests, which can be political and geostrategic and security. I can see some of the questions coming in in the chat, and we will address them in the Q&A. It's also a push and a pull. It's not just the EU pushing, but those countries and organizations in the region that are also pulling. That um, also leads me then to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Karthik Nachiapan, who hails from Vancouver, Canada. So I think you then cover the Pacific from the other side of the, the waters. Uh, you're a research fellow at the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. Um, your research is also focusing on political economy and technology 
in India, looking at cyber issues, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, mapping, and this is also of interest to us, mapping the intersect between 5G, cyber, and the Indo-Pacific. You studied at um, King's College, University of London, also in Toronto, and also in the China UNDP, uh, where you were in, in Beijing. So I'd now like to invite you to make a presentation of the uh, five-point plan to overcome some of the challenges that were mentioned by Micah. So please, the floor is yours for, for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Masad. Um, before I begin, I want to just thank Micah and Brigitte again for being great collaborators in this endeavor over the past few months. Um, I've learned a great deal about Europe and, and the EU's potential role in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so what I'll do in the next 10 minutes or so is to talk about the opportunities that exist on the digital and the tech, technological connectivity side in Asia uh, and the opportunities that are ripe for greater EU engagement. Uh, but, but, but before that, just broadly, just want to, you know, to say that uh, Asian countries, both in South and Southeast Asia, are undergoing uh, dramatic digital transformations that have only been turbocharged by the pandemic. Uh, so some of the shifts toward greater digitalization uh, that we're seeing now have been accelerated due to the lockdowns, the, res the restrictions, uh, and the other measures that have only made technology and the digital sphere more important uh, to the region's economic growth. However, more intense and deep digitalization also opens up uh, pathways and opportunities for external partners like the EU uh, who can support and advance uh, this digital trajectory in different ways. Uh, and so in the report, we identify five areas that are uh, prime for greater EU engagement. The first is the digital economy. Um, most countries, including India, uh, Singapore, uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Malaysia uh, have all made heavy investments uh, to advance uh, digitalization at home. Yet gaps still exist when it comes to expanding broadband access, which require greater attention. And the EU here can, can help drive uh, investment into telecom infrastructures which is a hardware that sustains and drives uh, these digital transformations. Now, broadband penetration as a whole remains low uh, across the ASEAN you know, with wide disparities. So some countries like Singapore uh, and, and, and Malaysia have better access, whereas other countries like Laos, Vietnam uh, don't have that. So there are clear gaps that can be addressed here. Uh, these investments could also serve uh, as a foundation that will drive other more focused European efforts uh, and objectives like digital access and inclusion and the need to build uh, more safe and secure um, cybersecurity architectures through which Asians communicate and interact directly. So that's the first area. The second area we look at is data. And if you look at these dramatic digital transformations in Asia, almost all of them hinge on data its availability, its access, and its openness. But managing data from a country perspective means having the wherewithal uh, and information to improve your digital services uh, and develop new ones for a rapidly growing digital consumer base. So naturally, as a result, uh, some countries like India prefer to manage data in a more restrictive manner to favor domestic innovation, uh, and objectives, while others in the region, like Singapore uh, and Indonesia, uh, are, are open to some form of um, data sharing while enabling enough data for domestic priorities, right? So there, is a, there are different kinds of data governance architectures in the region, uh, and we need some form of symmetry uh, going ahead. That said, data is also vital for digital trade between countries uh, across regions. So how open Indo-Pacific countries are uh, with respect to data regulation uh, will influence, will directly influence the opportunities that other firms, European, American, uh, and other countries that have across the region and what kind of regulatory constraints uh, will be imposed on them. 
So data rules really matter for uh, open digital trade. And here the EU can work with its Indo-Pacific partners to ensure that domestic laws that are being drafted in Asia across the Indo-Pacific do not constrain or stymie uh, data sharing between the Indo-Pacific and its European jurisdictions, while ensuring uh, that these laws also respect privacy and the digital rights of individuals. And, these, and this is important because these matters generally don't get enough attention uh, in data related debates in Asia. So privacy could be one clear um, area that the EU can advance through uh, data governance. So the EU should initiate dialogues that can support and steer uh, legislative and regulatory processes that are drafting and implementing uh, data protection laws across the Indo-Pacific and possibly even use the GDPR as a spur uh, to do that. Since countries uh, in the region have relied on, on, on the EU's data regulation to draft their domestic laws. So there's a pathway here for Europe to influence uh, data discussions across, across Asia. The third area is uh, FinTech. So Indo-Pacific countries are front runners uh, in the FinTech revolution, which refers to the use of digital uh, applications to support or provide uh, financial services and banking services. So several factors have fueled this um, ongoing digital uh, financial revolution in, in Asia. Financial markets continue to deregulate. Um, generally across Asia um, in the past, financial regulators have been insular and more restrictive, uh, favoring safety over innovation, um, but that has fundamentally changed. Uh, a lot of countries have opted to invest in digital platforms uh, both public and private to expand financial access and inclusion, especially for citizens uh, who are outside the mainstream financial system. And India is a clear example here as, as, as one country that's really uh, done quite a lot on financial access and financial inclusion through the digital means. Um, so mobile and contactless uh, payments dramatically lower the cost of providing basic financial services to Asian countries and Asian populations. And here the EU can share best practices uh, and other learnings that can assist uh, both ASEAN countries and other countries in South Asia, including India, um, leverage opportunities and improve cross-border payments, including remittances and business to business and business to consumer payments. Because there, there are clear gaps there when we're when we're talking about transacting across uh, jurisdictions from Asia to Europe. The fourth area, and, and which is connected to FinTech is digital infrastructures. Uh, the FinTech industry in Asia, um, especially India, can thank the public investments made on the digital front uh, for its uh, dramatic rise and success. And here I'm, I'm referring to the India Stack Framework, which is a three-tiered, a secure and interoperable digital platform that allows different actors, including citizens, uh, governments, uh, banks and financial institutions and tech startups uh, to engage financially with each other. So sending payments back and forth, uh, subsidies, entitlements and other kinds of transactions. And so this digital uh, architecture uh, dramatically improves financial access and interactions. And there's scope here for the EU to work with India uh, in its efforts to export this uh, digital infrastructure uh, abroad. Uh, and, and this effort here is crucial for expanding digital inclusion. And, and, and one way through which the EU can also look to promote uh, a human-centered digital agenda that hews closely to um, EU norms and standards. And we are already seeing new, new forms and patterns of of development assistance that come in the digital form with more that can be done here on issues like cybersecurity, network security, data, and digital literacy. The last uh, point uh, is, is, is big tech. Um, now one of the key priorities today uh, across the world is reigning in the power of big tech. And this is a uniquely global issue and problem. Uh, like the European Union and the United States, Policymakers across the Indo-Pacific region face challenges 
when it comes to uh, big tech and, and how to best manage and regulate digital markets, um, protect consumers from data breaches and cybercrime, um, manage and, and manage misinformation uh, and its effects on public safety and order. Uh, a lot of the questions around the regulation of both American and Chinese big tech firms are emerging across the Indo-Pacific. But debates here are still quite um, nascent uh, and are lagging in terms of how uh, countries can use different regulatory levers uh, to rein in um, big tech firms. So given the, their nascent stage of um, digital development, I think a lot of these Asian countries uh, often uh, can service jurisdictions where big tech firms exploit laws, uh, including issues like data collection and processing uh, and anti-competitive behaviors. So firms like Google and Facebook, for example, have faced uh, intense criticism for uh, indiscriminately collecting and monetizing data gathered from ASEAN and Indian consumers. Uh, and so the value that these firms extract from their data trumps the benefits uh, and the services that they generally provide. So what can happen now on this issue going forward? Um, more dialogues and coordination uh, between the EU and Indo-Pacific countries can definitely help a further a joint human-centered approach uh, that protects consumers uh, and fair markets as well as open um, democratic societies. Now, some of these interventions will also boost um, digital interoperability between the EU and, and Indo-Pacific countries when it comes to uh, the digital economy and e-commerce and, and having open digital markets that are not dominated by a few companies, but are open for all. And finally, in addition here, the EU can support uh, or drive the development of global rules that will apply to Indo-Pacific countries uh, sorry, global rules on technologies, but that will apply to Indo-Pacific countries. And that can be done through existing international organizations uh, like the WTO through its e-commerce framework, or the OECD, which is now focusing on digital taxes or through new ad hoc uh, technological frameworks and coalitions um, like the Quad or what the Australians have been increasingly talking about uh, with respect to network security. So there, there could be newer uh, pathways here in terms of exploring how the global governance of technology uh, will evolve going ahead. And the EU has a role to play in that. We definitely need more multilateralism on digital and tech issues well, going forward. And, 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 and the European Union can shape discussions um, to that end. I, I, I wanna end by saying that as the EU finalizes its Indo-Pacific strategy, um, digital and technology issues I should definitely feature, uh, given their importance to the Indo-Pacific's uh, growth, its uh, security outlook in the future, and its domestic governance, especially around technology issues. Uh, competition around technology and digital issues will only intensify, which makes its uh, domestic and international governance uh, more vital. And here the EU can, can, can forge a new path by establishing mutually beneficial partnerships and relationships on a broad array of digital issues that also reflect its core values and interests. Thank you. Um, th thank you so much for, for that very rich and, um, and well-argued presentation. All of the details are found in the excellent report on, on the five-point plan and also looking at specifically uh, examples and case studies from India, Indonesia, and Singapore, which are very different economies, but I think that would shed light on bringing many of these recommendations in, into, into greater, shining more light on them. Um, I'm very also interested in how to make the link between the five points that you've mentioned, basically digital economy, data governance, fintech, digital infrastructure, and regulating tech, in line with the four compass points that were mentioned, sort of infrastructure, government, business, and skills, and also linking up, I think, with the six points of the Indo-Pacific uh, Council conclusions that were mentioned. I think that was the challenge that Micah set to us, how to marry the 
connectivity, digital and Indo-Pacific, uh, how, how to bring the political, security and economic things together. Um, with that, I'd now like to open the floor. I, I, I can see two questions, uh, one from Jeroen Franken, and I'd like to ask Jeroen to maybe put that question in the, if I can ask Inge to, to give the floor to Jeroen, and that will be followed by Wilhelm Vosse, please. If you could explain, uh, put your question and then indicate who, would, who of the two panelists you would like to address that, please. Uh, thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, my question uh, came right after the uh, briefing uh, on the EU digital agenda, and I missed the threats for a digital agenda, uh, namely cyber, and as we see now also for democracies, fake news and all what you have, uh, I would say hybrid warfare. Uh, but uh, Maike already addressed some of uh, my concerns, uh, and uh, I just uh, wish to know how does the, de the EU digital strategy include defense against digital threats? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeroen. Um, maybe in, in terms of a comment with Maike, would you like to address also looking at the issue of digital threats and uh, defense issues because digital infrastructure, both hardware and software is an opportunity, but it also opens up to maybe dual use. And I think we've seen the whole debate about 5G and technology. Maybe if you could ad address that question and look at uh, threats to democracies. Uh, sure, the yes, well, it's an excellent question because uh, of course the, the contestation in this field is, is it lies exactly in the effects that you know digital instruments have on, on democracies and on the way firms can operate um, and I, it's a pity indeed I think uh, the answer would be better addressed by an EU official who's been working on this uh, on this document of course um, but um, to, to just give you my uh, you know uh, my interpretation, um, I, I think back of what uh, Thibaut Kleiner said about the positive approach. Um, and I think this is probably the explanation to why, you know, the, the terminology like cyber warfare is not mentioned. Uh, you will also notice, for example, in the Indo-Pacific strategy, um, that uh, the specifics of uh, what we do and do not share uh, with, for example, China are not mentioned. Although, of course, uh, for me as, a, as an outsider, I can more frankly say that this is, of course, also at the heart of, you know, why this Indo-Pacific uh, uh, strategy is, is in the making, um, because uh, there's these uh, sets of uh, common objectives that we share more with uh, some countries than others. Um, so specifically cyber warfare, I think would be, uh, and perhaps also the, you mentioned the digital threats to democracy. Uh, I see that addressed in the, um, in the paragraphs, for example, on the need to strengthen digital citizenship. If, if citizens are more aware of how data are monitored, are gathered and used, um, they will be more digitally skilled. Um, so not just digitally literate, but actually digitally skilled. They can develop more um, of this uh, so-called citizenship. Um, and there, that, that I think is also a way to sort of uh, ensure um, that it's not the government that needs so much to protect the citizens, but they can, uh, that the citizens are, are, are more active um, and more aware of, of the, the problematic elements also in the digital domain. Um, as they as they use this and the same can be said uh, about regulation uh, big tech regulation that the eu is engaging in is of course also addressing this very issue um, and the ai regulation that is now in the making uh, of which indeed yesterday uh, well it was uh, quite a bit in the news regulating the high risk uses of uh, technologies um, is also what the eu is engaging in so i think um, this is this is how the way uh, this is the way that the EU approaches uh, also the, the the very tricky issues um, the more security uh, issues uh, as you uh, call them. Um, thank you, Micah. Uh, I've also seen the the debate about or um, well, some have mentioned techno democracies versus techno autocracies uh, coming into this, and I think digital will be part of that uh, that uh, battle of ideas and uh, maybe the something to watch. 
I perhaps uh, Karthik can also mention uh, give his uh, views because from from my visits to Asia and obviously that's more than a year uh, ago now so I'm not sure where things stand today uh, but I noticed that at least in public discussions uh, it's also very difficult to have these um, all these elements uh, for discussion on the table uh, whereas in you know privately um, this is of course uh, better discussed. Um, so over to Singapore what, what's your take on on the question of cyber warfare and digital threats to democracies? Well, I mean, I think um, the challenge here is uh, that a lot of these discussions are securitized in Asia, um, especially around, um, around data, around information, around how to protect these, 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 these really complex but growing in infrastructures which are used for our daily communication, commerce and interactions, right? Uh, the challenge is to get bureaucrats, get regulators, get <laughs> officials to have open dialogues with the public, with other actors on these issues. And especially in India, if you look at the cybersecurity discussions um, and, la and largely because of, I mean, India's, India has become the, the country that's received almost the first or the second highest number of cyber attacks over the last few years. Um, because of that, and because of uh, the challenges associated with uh, defending uh, a, a vast cyber infrastructure, a lot of these discussions are actually taking place internally and they're securitized, which is such a level where even the public is not really getting a good understanding of how to improve their behavior online, right? So, we can do a lot more in Asia to open up, get, get these discussions more public uh, mm -hmm. and less securitized. So we can actually come up with some rules on these matters. And, 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 and I guess the, the, the part on democracy, um, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's useful to have democracies kind of talking about these issues more openly, but a lot of these threats are actually emerging from countries that are not democracies or, or, or uh, states that are kind of semi-authoritarian or somewhere on the authoritarian bent. So how do we also get, how, how do we get them to the table and how do we have frank and open discussions uh, with them on these issues is what's gonna matter more going ahead. So which is why the, you know, the, the, the global governance part of it, and what's happening at the UN, what's happening at the GGE uh, and the OEWG is extremely important because we need to talk about China, we need to talk about Russia, uh, if we're really gonna understand um, what these digital threats are and how countries, not just in the Indo-Pacific, but across Europe and North America can somehow um, combat this going ahead. Um, th thank you for, for sharing those two perspectives, but I think even those countries that are described as democracies or describe themselves as democracies are also facing some of these challenges with threats to civil society and, uh, and also uh, digital rights, because rights that are provided in non-digital space should also be provided in digital space. So something to watch and be vigilant about. Um, I'd now like to ask the next uh, questioner, uh, Wilhelm Foster, please take the floor. And although I think George was kind enough to make the presentation at the beginning, maybe the, the China question, if you could put to the two panelists and we'd be happy to hear from them. Willem, over to you. Thank you very much for taking my question. The specific question is that the new European IP or Indo-Pacific Indo strategy mentions China actually only once in connection with the comprehensive agreement on investment. And my question, which is maybe sounds slightly ironic, is is China considered a like-minded Indo-Pacific partner to foster principles of quality and sustainable connectivity? So this related, this question was kind of already touched upon in, in, to some degree, but if you have a strategy, the strategy is full of good intentions and good points, but a strategy also needs maybe the negative definition of what it does not want to foster or support. Thank you. Maybe if, if I could ask George, who's um, kindly put on his camera, so he's been listening very diligently. George, how would you? I have, I've been a good boy. <laughs> uh, yes, um, yes. So, uh, no, 
China is uh, not considered to be uh, like-minded, uh, like-minded um, in the Indo-Pacific um, strategy can be defined as um, countries and individuals and partners generally that um, have uh, same principles and values, more or less the same principles as values as the European Union as, as per universal values as defined by the United Nations. Um, so um, um, this is the, the answer to that question. However, as my presentation said, um, you know, we can and will and do work with uh, China where there is uh, common interest, uh, and in particular on those big global questions um, such as uh, climate change. Um, actually, I'm going to kick the ball back uh, to Assad uh, on the connectivity side briefly because um, there were plans, I think, for China and the EU to work on routes through Asia, and I'm not sure what the latest is on that, but I think the audience will find that interesting. In, and of course, we are promoting you know, um, higher quality uh, connectivity, and we're in dialogue in China about that concerning uh, its BRI. If I may, over to you, Assad, and maybe the others. Thank you. Thank you, George, and thank you, Willem, for the question. Um, I, I think um, with, with China, we have a multifaceted approach. So the EU has announced on the 12th of March 2019 its vision. And one is looking at China as a, as a uh, partner where we can engage with China, for example, on climate change. Another area is we see China as a competitor. And I think maybe for that, we need a level playing field and we need uh, more openness on, on the business side. But thirdly, we see China as a systemic rival which is also um, on the value side. And I, I've also seen, I was in China in Beijing for four years and in Hong Kong for four years, so in China for eight years, but there's something called the social credit system where based on what you're doing on social media, you, you can be assigned a certain score and based on that score, you may not be able to travel, you might not be able to book a hotel or even leave the country. So I think, there, there are pluses and minuses. The only time I would use cash in China was when my battery was down because everything is used on the phone. Uh, in some ways, e-commerce is much better developed. Um, uh, as, as regards um, the connectivity engagement with China, we have a connectivity platform that was launched in 2015. Uh, DG Move, uh, or DG Transport, if you like, of the Commission is responsible. And as George mentioned, there's a study that is taking place between the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development on the EU side and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, looking at the feasibility of, of uh, routes in Central Asia. So that, that kicked off at the beginning of this year. So that's something we're looking at. Uh, but I think we still engage in discussions with China, but we're very, we are looking uh, very carefully at, um, at issues of sustainability and a level playing field. I, I also see uh, Clara Yurkova, who is um, from in, in Prague. She was the uh, charge d'affaires for the Czech Republic and instrumental in the Belt and Road Forum negotiations of the summit statement. So I'm, I'm pleased to say hello to Clara and I understand she would, uh, if I understand, would like to ask a question or make a comment, please. Uh, hello, Asad. Uh, thank you very much uh, for calling up on me. Uh, regards to everyone. Uh, I actually was not uh, trying to uh, make a question, but I can uh, uh, ask. Uh, I came a bit late uh, to the uh, seminar. But uh, uh, I uh, heard the uh, second presentation the whole lot. And of course, I just uh, would like to confirm that uh, in con with countries like, for example, India, when, the, uh, when we are preparing, the EU is preparing the summit, uh, the data uh, is uh, the topic that we concentrate on. And also as for the Czech Republic, we had some comments in that front. Uh, but I uh, believe that it's uh, instrumental to 
concentrate on this topic and also involve all other countries, uh, mainly like-minded, but I think it's also important to discuss the topic with uh, uh, the, the other ones uh, where the threats are coming from, like China and Russia, uh, uh, so that uh, we can somehow uh, better understand uh, how to solve this globally. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, it's a long shot to have some uh, answers soon. Uh, and on the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, yeah, I think it's very uh, important that uh, strategies like the Indo-Pacific one, Indo one that is in the making or the strategy uh, on connectivity, which is uh, mainly Asia, but uh, there are talks now on making it more global are there and that we together with Europeans and also like-minded discuss all these issues that are so dear to us and are uh, instrumental for promoting norms and standards in the whole area. So thank you very much. It's very interesting to listen to you and we are looking forward to the second uh, connectivity forum that will hopefully uh, be held and at the end of next year, or oh, this year, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Clara, for, for your comments and insights. Um, if there are any other questions, I'd like to ask um, participants to put them in the chat. If, if not, I would like to ask um, maybe a last question to both Micah and Karthik. If, if you had a magic wand and were able to decide where the EU should put its money under the Digital Connectivity Fund under your five points, where do you think uh, we should be uh, investing in digital connectivity in terms of flagship projects or concrete activities, uh, something substantive that we can show and tell. So maybe just to reverse the order, if I can ask Karthik to go first, please. You know, when, uh, when Thibaut was speaking about the fund, I, I kept thinking about broadband. Uh, I think even though we often talk about Indo-Pacific and how the, a lot of the economies here are rapidly growing and they're super connected and there's so much potential and promise, we tend to forget that there are huge gaps in terms of broadband access. Just, just look at India, there are about four or 500 million people, I think lack access to the internet. Right? And you kind of will definitely muster up another a few hundred million in Southeast Asia as well. So there are tremendous gaps in terms of just getting people online. Um, so there's a development, there's a huge development dimension to these technological shifts, these technological changes, and the whole connectivity paradigm and debates that we're having, which require more attention. Uh, and so, and that's something that, that a lot of these states uh, for various reasons um, cannot go and raise that money themselves. Right? I mean, either they lack uh, access to financial markets or they're indebted or they're facing different uh, priorities uh, and, 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 and trade-offs, um, especially in a pandemic scenario. So if, if, if there's one thing which uh, that I think more investment, more attention, more money uh, can be directed towards, it's just expanding the amount of people that are entering online. Um, so they have the tools, they have the necessary um, devices, systems to better their own lives. So broadband access is what I would uh, hope for I mean, the EU's new digital fund to focus on. Thank you, Karthik. Uh, Micah, would you agree or disagree with Karthik on where to put the fund, fund money? Well, I, obviously, I cannot disagree. This is a, an important point, I think, that we make also in the uh, in, in our report. Um, I guess I would uh, add to what Karthik said, which is uh, he's emphasizing the hardware. Um, so let me be the European and, and focus on the software here, um, where I think, uh, of course, the, the way the modalities of connectivity, the way that we use do broadband, the way that Internet is being developed, um, I think we really have to invest also in, in shaping that bottom up. Uh, so making sure that we have sort of the, the, the innovators that work with open source um, uh, well, uh, tools and towards op open source networks 
Um, because, well, that's another way to sort of rein in uh, the big tech companies, I think. Uh, it's a bottom-up effort that can work towards, you know, more digitally uh, skilled people um, and citizens that, that are aware of, again, what's happening uh, when, they, when they go online. But first of all, they have to be able to go online. That's a way to, to really, uh, well, kickstart development. Uh, and then you have to also make sure, you know, that they do so under their right modalities. Thank you. And that, that's also digital ODA, which I think is uh, Micah copyright. <laughs> um, we have another piece come forthcoming on that. Oh, ah, great. Okay, conversation continues. Um, maybe a last question I, I could just ask you. Can you name a song, a book or a film that reminds you of connectivity? Uh, maybe, because I, I remember we had a previous discussion and Shahde Islam, who's also listening in, mentioned um, Freddie Mercury, because he was born in Zanzibar, comes of Indian heritage, also uh, is a world citizen and connecting people through music. So um, who wants to go first? Uh, volunteers? <laughs> Micah. Wow, that's a, a tough one. Um, on, on, on music, I'm not, I'm not so sure. If I think of a, a documentary or a drama slash documentary, um, but that's really, really very much about digital connectivity and the modalities of it. That's, of course, uh, the, the social dilemma that you can find on Netflix, which right. I think is, uh, is a great um, way of explaining what happens uh, when, you know, when you do social media, how it works mm -hmm. um, and, and what the impact is of, of those social networks. Uh, it really got me thinking um, about how to, um, well, how to engage with those platforms. Um, so that's, yeah, that, that's one thing that I would think of. Uh, I'm not sure if that's uh, in any way comparable with uh, Freddie Mercury. Um, Great, thanks. So that's a, a bit of product placement for Social Dilemma, but I've, I've watched it and would agree with you. Karthik, any uh, art, film, book, music, uh, connecting people? Well, maybe a book, um, a novel. Um, Ian McEwan's, um novel in 2019, Machines Like Me, which is a oh. very uh, witty, futuristic uh, novel about a man and his machine. But it's also a cautionary tale about technology, how humans relate to technology, artificial intelligence, mm. um, ethics, and uh, consent. So I, I think the book forces us to ask what the moral consequences and the implications of these new and disruptive uh, technologies, um, especially AI. Uh, so a technology, uh, so, a, so as technology and the digital become more and more central you know, to our lives, what effects does that have on um, relationships, personal interactions and decision-making and the thorny ethical dilemmas that we will eventually all have to encounter whether at the individual level uh, at the societal level or at the governmental level. So um, I, would, I would maybe mention that. And I'm also looking forward to reading the new Ishiguro book on AI, yeah. Clara and the Sun, which I hear is, uh, touches upon similar themes and is really good. Um, I, I was gonna mention Clara and, Clara and the Sun. We also heard from Clara, but uh, this is from Japanese British writer, uh, Kazuo Ishiguro, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but that, that's quite an interesting read and thought provoking about how the world could be post 2030. So we, we can see if the digital compass worked or the made in China 2030 or made in India and see the brave new world of the future. George. Yes, I was going to say that uh, this, this um, gentleman was, um, there's a documentary on the BBC um, I think at some point this week or next week, which will delve into this whole artificial intelligence um, aspect. Um, and uh, this, uh, this Japanese gentleman that's been um, writing a book on the subject. But I was going to give you my suggestion, unless I got, unless I got uh, things mixed up, I reckon the French connection, surely that title must mean that there has to be a connection with this, uh, with this discussion today. Excuse um, my humor. <laughs> well, the, the Fr French presidency will be uh, in the driving seat from next year. So I think watch, watch this space on the French connection on the Indo-Pacific. 
So thank you very much for this um, hour of intellectual power with our two esteemed panelists, plus George. Um, and with that, um, we look forward to, re to reading the next installments of, of your various research papers. So thank you again, and a big thank you to In Inga for organizing this. I now turn to Ambassador at Large and Special Envoy for Connectivity, Romana Flahutin. She's a diplomat um, hailing from Croatia. Uh, she was advisor to the president there, has been formerly head of delegation for the EU with the EU hat on in Albania, which uh, Western Balkans is, is a prime example of connectivity in action, and was also deputy head of uh, mission in Serbia in, during interesting times, and also served at the embassy in the United States, so has very strong trans transatlantic credentials and contact. And Romana is my boss, so I have to be careful what I say. So Romana, over to you. <laughs> So, uh, wrap, wrapping this up together, please. Thanks a lot. And uh, you know that um, the, the least thing that I want are people to be careful what I say. <laughs> I think that uh, it's, it's really important to be able to express what we think. Let me just, uh, before I, I move into sort of closing remarks, give you uh, my piece of music, which sort of... Um, uh, links uh, with, with a question. Um, I, I was thinking of Sting and, you know, every move you make, every breath you take, I'll be watching you. Uh, so um, I think this is a, an extremely um, important debate. Uh, a lot has been said. Um, I don't want to repeat all the, all the elements and, and, and the details. Let me try to sum up. But before that, I really want to think, thank Micah and Catherine uh, for, for the study uh, of great quality. Uh, I want to thank all colleagues uh, who also helped us um, work on, on understanding the context today. So Thibault, George, uh, Assad, uh, all of you who, who tuned in, um, this is uh, important. And I, I would try to sum up why. Uh, first, both Indo-Pacific and digital are two central themes of our time. For, for Indo-Pacific, it is clear that is the most vital and growing uh, part uh, uh, in the world. Uh, some numbers were mentioned already by George. Um, it produces at the moment two thirds of global growth. Um, by 2030, 90% of new middle class will come from that region. Uh, so um, little wonder that a lot of uh, a lot of uh, attention is paid for for Indo Pacific. And second, digital um, Tibo walked us through some elements, but I I remember one uh, quote from Social Dilemma, which has uh, stuck with me since then. Uh, that you know, for those who were born in the uh, before the 70s um, it will be it will be an interesting comparison um, in the 70s the the speed of the plane was the same as is today the speed of the car today is twice as it was in the in the 70s the speed of the train or trains today is three times as it was in the 70s but the speed of data travel, if you wish, or data exchange is one trillion times what it was in the 70s. And I think that really uh, gives you uh, a sense of what we are dealing, dealing with and what kind of opportunities, but also challenges are, are before us. Second, I think we are witnessing an important historic pivot, mutual pivot between EU and Indo-Pacific. Uh, which will have long-term strategic implications for our economies, uh, but also for the protection of fundamental freedoms and for security, global security. And, and then finally, uh, this is a debate of the future. And it makes me very happy that, that we are engaging on time and that we are engaging with knowledge. I think this is crucial uh, for us to be able to understand what is, what is before us. Let me go back briefly to the study. Uh, I think it's excellent uh, analysis. There are some very sort of 
uh, practical uh, recommendations that we should be following up. Uh, key takeaway that EU and member states, of course, need to increase uh, their engagement with all stakeholders in, in the Pacific. Um, five actionable steps, e-commerce, data governance, fintech, digital infrastructure, and a regulation of big tech. I would like in particular to uh, highlight the importance, really a, a historical opportunity for development dimension and for development, the countries that are uh, in the, in, in, still in development. Um, investment in digital skills, investment in digital infrastructure can help jump a generation in terms of development, can really push these countries forward in a way that was not imaginable 20, 30 years ago. And also, uh, if we miss this, uh, it could push them back for more than a generation. So that would be a huge loss if we do not invest uh, properly, uh, timely, and at a scale that is needed into, into both digital infrastructure and digital skills. Uh, and the second thing is partnerships are key. Uh, community of like-minded uh, 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 nations uh, and their partnerships are key so that we can invest in our growth, but while investing in our growth, we also invest in the protection of our fundamental freedoms and our, and our overall security. And I think this needs to go hand in hand. It's interdependent um, and also will help us understand and be better positioned to manage our relationship with non-democracies. So, um, I mean, every single word of this debate is, is important and I'm grateful for, for the opportunity to listen and to contribute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Romana. And uh, I think um, it's been a, a great opportunity to exchange. I, I'm sorry we were unable to take all the questions because of the lack of time. And I'd like to thank the the participants who've taken valuable time out to, to tune into this debate. But this is a conversation which will continue. Thank you very much for the intellectual input and for time. And uh, we look forward to taking this to the future. And I end with a quote from Sun, from Sun Tzu, who said, opportunities multiply as they are seized. So if we take the chance to uh, jump and be early movers on digital connectivity, I think this will bear fruit for the future. So wishing everybody safe travels, both mental and physical and spiritual, wishing you all the best. And we, we take to heart um, your advice of, um, of both books and songs and uh, art. So thank you again and stay safe, everybody. Over and out, take care. Thank you. Stay safe.